and then we'll get started. So I'll just come on. <clears throat> Okay, I'm going to go roll one more time and <clears throat> give everybody an opportunity who has not indicated uh, who you are to do so. Uh, Jihan, Ona, Mike Love, Ruby, Unique, Timba, Penny, Chimaranga, Ali, Kitty, Kayfin, Likia, Bredora, Star, uh, Janice, Makta, Taylor, Opa, who else did I not call? Ali Enza. Yeah. Uh, Johnny, please turn that off. Oh, that's well, no, I'm sorry, I was just calling your name, but I was hearing somebody. Oh, that's uh, you. You're hearing yourself. Somebody was playing myself. No. All right, comrades. Uh, <clears throat> first, let's let me express a deep appreciation for everybody starting uh, this year with me. I'm um, excited um, about uh, the year that's opening up. I know that um, a lot of people will have already and uh, will soon <coughs> go out and uh, purchase a lot of uh, expensive uh, clothes hangers that they call treadmills and uh, do other kinds of things with the promise of uh, this year, finally getting in shape and losing weight and all those other wonderful things. And I hope you do all of those things. Uh, but what's a great way to start the year um, in struggle and to uh, have uh, this opportunity? I'm very excited about the study that we uh, this particular study that we've been involved in for a couple of weeks now uh, in the Black Power since the 1960s uh, book, which is uh, 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 a number of articles and uh, presentations that, and um, most of which uh, appeared in the Burning Spear newspaper in 1989 and began in 1989. And um, these were critical kinds of uh, presentations that uh, were concentrated and really concerned uh, about ideological uh, issues that confront our movement. And because as just like today, uh, at that moment, our, our movement as courageous and bold as it has been uh, in the past, uh, suffered severely uh, from ideological weakness, a lack of ideological clarity and ability to say uh, who we are, where it is that we're trying to go, other than uh, the simple uh, uh, ongoing incantations about being black and, and um, kind of thing, which is not good enough. Uh, so we engaged then in very serious kind of uh, ideological and political struggles, fundamentally important. Uh, a, week, a couple of weeks ago, someone in, uh, participated in the study uh, uh, that was really concerned because felt, he felt like uh, engaging in these ideological uh, struggles and, and and uh, discussions, political struggles, reflected some kind of disrespect uh, for uh, soldiers and comrades, many of whom have paid dear prices with their freedom and their lives uh, 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 in this struggle, and uh, felt like uh, this was not good to make uh, criticisms. And I want to say that uh, clearly we disagreed with that. Uh, clearly, this study is something that was initiated uh, by the African People's Socialist Party. Uh, in the beginning, uh, we started this because of the huge number of people who were being recruited uh, into uh, the African People's Socialist Party. Uh, the conditions out in the world, the activities of the party have resulted in a number, a growing number of people 
that especially young people being attracted to the African People's Socialist Party. And that's a good thing. But uh, the thing is that we're not just uh, some kind of group. We're not just a group that uh, has a leader uh, that talks a lot and that people can come in and participate in discussions. This is not some kind of internet session uh, that can be thrilling and people can feel satisfied after having uh, viewed, or dissatisfied for that matter, after having uh, viewed uh, something. Uh, we have said and truly believe it's not even about uh, simply explaining the world, but ultimately the question is changing the world. And so uh, we have a revolutionary theory. We have come to understand a long time ago that, uh, that revolution is absolutely necessary if Africans are going to be free. It doesn't matter how many likes you get on Facebook, how many hits you get through some kind of live video, YouTube, or something to that effect. The question is, uh, to what end? Uh, is any activity that we are involved, uh, where is it that we want uh, to see African people moving to? What is the vehicle that must be used in order to change the actual material conditions that African people are confronted with? These are critical questions. I was listening to a presentation just the other day by, it may have been, uh, it was either a message to the grassroots or the ballot of the bullet, and uh, he was talking then about how people were carelessly using the word revolution without understanding what this really means and what are the motives of a revolution and what are the objectives of a revolution, what's the methods used to, uh, to uh, make a revolution. And he was making this presentation at a time where a movement was confronted again with the question of what is it that we are about. But at least then, when Malcolm was talking about uh, the, uh, this revolutionary question, uh, people were talking about revolution. Today we're in a place where re revolution isn't even on the agenda, which is why uh, our party is having uh, our plenary that's going to be happening uh, a, a week or so, six days from now, beginning from the 7th through the 9th here in St. Petersburg, Florida, with uh, a theme of putting revolution back on the agenda because uh, that's something that we have to reintroduce uh, into the question, uh, into the discussion. And we don't talk uh, just to talk. Uh, and to make a revolution, there are certain things that are required, and that's what we are about. Uh, to make a revolution, uh, you have to have uh, a situation of crisis. As I say, the system, the social system has to be experiencing crisis. And uh, what is very clear today to anybody who is conscious uh, is that uh, the country, the world is crisis ridden. You see crisis everywhere, unending wars, uh, uh, attack on all kinds of peoples, the inability of the uh, white ruling class to hold on uh, to uh, uh, the situation that he had previously assumed to be permanent. Uh, people everywhere in struggle trying to change their conditions. In order for there to be revolution, there has to be crisis. Uh, in order to, for there to be revolution, uh, the people have to have come to the conclusion that anything is better than this. That they have to be prepared and willing to risk their lives and put their lives on the line to, to do anything to change their circumstances. In order uh, for there to be revolution, uh, it is also necessary uh, for the ruling class to be unable to rule in the same old way. Something that keeps smacking people in the face. We've seen a situation where the rulers in this country have had to uh, resort to the unthinkable, and that is putting a Negro uh, in the White House, a black face in the White House, can't rule in the same old way. And this uh, recent election that has resulted in the ascendancy, some might say descendancy, of Donald Trump uh, to the presidency of the United States has obviously come as a consequence of the inability of the ruling class to rule in the same old way. In order for there to be revolution, uh, there must also be a revolutionary party that is guided by advanced revolutionary theory. These are requirements for revolution. We say that's what it is that we are about as a party. And we want to be clear about this. We are not about the number of hits we get uh, on live videos, uh, uh, number of likes we get uh, uh, on Facebook, etc. We are about making a revolution. 
And, uh, but there have been very few standards uh, for what our struggle is about in the recent period. The United States government murdered the revolution. The reason uh, in the last period, for more than two generations, we haven't been engaged in a discussion about revolution is because this government, the American government, uh, killed Malcolm X, uh, killed Martin Luther King. Uh, many of the revolutionary organizations, most of the revolutionary organizations destroyed the Black Panther Party, uh, arrested and murdered people throughout this country. And there have been two generations that they've succeeded uh, in preventing the revolution from raising its head in part by keeping African people drugs, sticking dope in our communities, uh, first heroin, uh, then uh, cocaine or a derivative of a cocaine called crack. And now there's heroin again and the government is now legalizing marijuana so that uh, instead of seeing revolution and the need to struggle to change our circumstances, the government is making sure it does everything for us to make it possible for us to be satisfied with our circumstances by one drug or another. Hence, uh, on every corner, uh, in every African community, you're subject to find liquor stores and churches, and of course, there are the illegal dope dens, and increasingly what we're finding is that the government is sanctioning uh, marijuana, so you'll find that uh, here as well. Marijuana won't be found in the white community, churches are in the white community too. Uh, liquor stores in the white community too, but not in the way they are in the African community. And then the African community, because the African community is busy trying to subdue pain that's caused by colonialism. Other people have a, a greater capacity to uh, experience uh, uh, these, these mind-numbing uh, uh, kinds of uh, drugs uh, in some kind of moderation. Because uh, for them, uh, uh, they're not trying to deal with an enduring, never-ending, ubiquitous pain that comes as a consequence of being colonized, that comes as a consequence of uh, everybody having a relative that's in jail, going to jail, being shot by the police, being shot by somebody else, not having enough weight to free feed ourselves, et cetera, et cetera. And this is the basis of where uh, they can say, okay, drugs are good for everybody and Africans are going to do more drugs than anybody because Africans are in more pain than anybody and need uh, uh, drugs not as uh, just some kind of uh, afterthought or some kind of plaything, but as a, a way to numb the pain. And what we say is what we need is revolution. Uh, I want to say that uh, this is an important study, uh, as I mentioned earlier, and I went through this uh, this long thing, this long overview, uh, in part because I want to emphasize something. I mentioned how one brother thought that it was very bad and disrespectful that we were engaged in criticizing a political uh, uh, tendency and a, an ideological uh, expression existing in our movement. Actually, we talked about Pan-Africanism, and, and the main thrust of the discussion has been a criticism of uh, the new Africanist tendency, the new Africanist uh, ideology in our movement. Uh, and uh, it, we didn't start off and say, let's pick somebody to criticize. What we said uh, was that there's something very serious happening in, in our community. There's an aggression, a serious aggression of, uh, of oppression. Uh, the government is moving in a certain way that clearly indicates an escalation of the attacks on African people who are colonized here in America and our movement is extraordinarily weak. And one of the things that we are facing is an ideological and political weakness in our movement. And we want to look at that. And particularly, uh, not just in general terms, we didn't do much criticism of the NAACP or the Irving League or the Southern Christian Leadership Conference because we recognize that these are forms of assimilation that uh, represent a completely different uh, kind of tendency. But the other tendency within the movement, the other broad tendency, has to do with recognizing that we are colonized. White nationalist colonial power that has taken over our lives and has done that uh, going on uh, uh, something like you know, 500 years. And that this group is the most critical group, the ones who are struggling against colonialism, against foreign domination. Uh, that's the critical group that we uh, have to be concerned about because we are the ones who are going to make the difference in whether we become free or not or whether we continue to find a, a struggle to try to find a place on the plantation uh, that is uh, uh, something that's more comfortable than the one we have today. Engaged uh, in this struggle and, and talk about uh, criticism within this movement because this 
is the broad movement that will be responsible for assaulting colonial and foreign domination of African people. And when I say foreign domination, I ain't talking about no Russians, and I ain't talking about no Muslims or Arabs. I'm talking about the United States government. I'm talking about white power. I'm talking about imperialism that came into existence as a consequence of the attack on Africa, African people, uh, and other oppressed peoples around the world. So we believe that ideological struggle is good, that it offers uh, our movement an opportunity to grow, provides within the struggle itself a contest of ideas. It, it says that ideas are extremely important and that uh, the way the movement grows is not through some stagnant situation where everybody just say, okay, we agree and march along or stand still, uh, but the contest of ideas is just a good idea. Does this make sense toward getting us to freedom? That's the kind of thing that we think is, provides a certain kind of dynamism uh, that helps us to develop as a movement. Now, this is different from the kind of nonsense that some of you may have viewed recently on Facebook or what have you. Uh, uh, I thought it was the most disgusting thing I've seen in a very long time, and I have still been unable to digest the entire thing. I've watched only a short period of it. I'm talking about this thing uh, uh, that Uma Johnson, he calls himself a doctor, uh, Uma Johnson, who uh, was uh, uh, the prince of uh, Pan-Africanism, which is a statement in and of itself that somebody would, uh, in 2017 now, uh, be identifying uh, with royalty. I mean, the prince of uh, Pan-Africanism uh, is an incredibly significant statement, but the obscenities, the uh, attack, they're concerned about it, about this, but even some of the best people who came out against him missed the point, I believe, because uh, the real, there are several, there are a couple of important issues here, and one of them is that there is no political discussion at all. What is the political struggle? What are the political issues that are at stake there? I didn't hear any of that. That's what we're talking about here. When we make criticism now, the criticism is based on some kind of polit politic, some political issue, something that, uh, how does whatever uh, Mr. Johnson was talking about contribute to the struggle for liberating our people? Uh, as opposed to the bit that I heard where the debate, he was debating himself, it seems, about who uh, was the leader or the chief or the king or some other kind of thing of the, what he called the RBG, the red, black, and green, or the conscious movement uh, gets more people to come out uh, when they speak and who gets the most speaking engagements. It was the most ridiculous kind of thing. The point is it had nothing to do about our folks. It had nothing to do with the political contradictions that we're confronted with. It had nothing to do even with where it is we're trying to go as a people. What is the struggle about as a people? None of that was even discussed. And that's disgusting because uh, it simply revolved around this person and whomever it was is that he was debating uh, as opposed to uh, looking at the questions that are confronting us. And if you're going to criticize somebody, make it a political criticism, make it a, a criticism of somebody based on whether or not they are contributing to or uh, attacking the struggle of our people, the advancement of our people. But in order to do that, you got to say, what is the struggle about? What is the struggle about? That's, we hear these uh, neutral kinds of inanities like uh, uh, white supremacy, etc. What does that mean? Uh, uh, and so that was the, one of the issues. The other issues with what Mr. Johnson was doing, and I don't know how much the other person that he was the, uh, allegedly debating in this discussion, I don't know how much he participates in this process, but the other problem with it is that it really undermines the stature of our movement, the integrity of our struggle. Here somebody is attacking somebody because they're light-skinned. It's somebody attacking somebody because they're short. What kind of ridiculous uh, struggle is that? And then threatening, uh, actually threatening some kind of physical confrontation. I'm going to be in your town soon. And when I get there, sort of daring somebody to come out, etc. 
And the problem with this kind of thing is that we've seen something similar to this. No, in my, in, in all of my years in the movement, nothing as nasty and open as what we just saw by someone who's supposed to be representative of some kind of black people. It's the movement up for fierce, serious kind of attack by the federal government, by the United States government, by police who will infiltrate our organizations and they send nasty messages to each other saying so and so said this about you and this about you and then we get bogged down and shoot us or the government gets bogged down and shoot us that they can blame on somebody because of this kind of politics that has been introduced a, a very serious a uh, horrible kind of politics that has been introduced into our movement from the outside that has nothing to do with our movement when has you ever heard of malcolm x talking like that severely the civil rights movement he criticized king he criticized other people the big six you remember that but you never heard him talking about anybody in this fashion and he also always used a political basis for what he said about somebody he never just came out because you're short because you like skin profanity and was using the vulgarity that this man was using it's an insult insult and an assault on our struggle and I have some problem with that but that's not what this is about because yes we engage in serious criticism but I want you to be able to hear this felt like we were insulting somebody because we were making political and ideological criticism hear this advance our struggle that our movement has been stagnant for more than two generations after the government murdered and killed people and then it crushed the movement at the end of the 1960s and we are entering now to 2017. And, and we have to go beyond where we were in the 60s when the, when the movement was crushed. So there were a lot of people who, and organizations who were there in the 1960s, but they crushed the revolutionary movement before many of the ideological and political questions that we're dealing with ever got resolved. But they didn't crush the Uhuru movement the African People's Socialist Party. So we have been in a process of 45 years of constant development, even as many other forces have been pushed out of, out of political life. And that we are having now is not based on some nonsense about who is light-skinned, who is dark-skinned, who is tall, who is short, some personal beef that exists among any of us. But it has to do with how do we move from where we are circumstances that we are confronted with as a people around the world how do we move from where we are that our people and our children deserve that's the struggle that we want to engage in so i just want to do that brief overview it wasn't as brief as some of you would have liked i'm sure uh because we have to move uh, rather quickly uh, with this discussion but I'm excited about this discussion. Uh, uh, I'm not, this was a horribly uh, proofed and horribly copy edited book. I don't know how it passed muster uh, in 1990 uh, when uh, it was published, but it, it was poorly done in that fashion. But it was an exciting African People's Socialist Party. We were in extreme motion then as we are now. And uh, we saw that our movement uh, was confronted with the serious contradictions then as we are now. Uh, and it's very exciting because there we see uh, hundreds of people had for entry into the African People's Socialist Party. That's why we're doing this discussion, by the way, uh, to rapidly, as, as rapidly as we can, uh, bring uh, people who are in the party, people who are trying to come into the party uh, up to par ideologically and politically. So we are on page 49 of uh, what uh, was put forth in a book, uh, Black Power Since the 60s, uh, The Struggle Against Opportunism Within the U.S. Front of the Black Liberation Movement. Uh, and this is a chapter with the headline, The Revolutionary Party is the Vehicle for Making the Revolution. And this uh, uh, presentation was made on June 20th, 1989. Uh, at an open meeting of the Uhuru Solidarity Committee in Oakland, California. So, Uhuru, in our movement right now, we are at a very interesting and important place. The Uhuru movement, 
the struggle to develop the African People's Socialist Party, the African People's Solidarity Committee, and the Uhuru Solidarity Committee. In the last two issues of the Burning Spear, we have raised up some of the struggles that we think are fundamental to pushing the movement forward. We have opened up struggle with various tendencies inside the anti-colonialist movement that we think don't actually represent freedom, liberation, or the struggle for socialism in the world and in this country. You don't have to agree with what we said, but this is what, I'm, what, what it's about. We said that open up a struggle with various tendencies inside the anti-colonialist movement that we think don't actually represent freedom, liberation, or the struggle for socialism in the world and in this country. That's what this is about. It's not about somebody being short, tall, light-skinned, or how many hits they get on Facebook or something like that, or how many invitations they get to speak at places. This is about, uh, again, uh, the, the struggle for freedom, liberation, and the struggle for socialism, and we are critiquing the tendencies within the, uh, the anti-colonial movement in this country uh, for uh, how, that, uh, how this, these tendencies represent uh, where it is that we need to go. It's not a new thing that we're doing. People familiar with the history of the party, in 1972 we, involved, we were involved in a struggle with Don L. Lee, now known as Matabudi, who is uh, a member of the broad pro-independence anti-colonial movement inside this country. He is what some people in the Black Panther Party would have referred to as a cultural nationalist. And an aspect of this, uh, because we wrote a pamphlet that said something about this. Our objective was to take people to revolution. And if we see people heading to the swamp, we have to say, no, 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 that swamp quit sand ahead. This is where we have to go in order to be free. And a part of this struggle was based on some narrow uh, assumption in something that Don L. Lee had written that uh, suggested that African people had to speak Swahili or some African language because it affected how we thought about stuff in order to be free. Uh, we had people like Emil Cacabra who spoke Portuguese. Uh, we had people, uh, and, and he was on the African continent, he was an African. And we had people all around the continent who spoke all kinds of different languages, and some of them were European languages. Malcolm X did not speak Swahili. He didn't speak Lingala or anything like that, but Lumumba did. And the point is that when you are talking about revolution, we see Said, we said, if the question is revolution, if that's the question, as opposed to some cultural uh, expression independent of the revolutionary movement, if it is revolution, then the language is revolutionary language. And so when, uh, when people said, a luta continua uh, in Portuguese, which means the struggle continues, down, we understood it all around the world. Uh, whatever language it is that we spoke, when they said, pambere ne chimuringa, which means forward with the revolution. Revolution. We all got that, got that. And the thing is that in the part of the struggle, what we find is revolutionary, the, the language becomes revolutionary and people can communicate quite well. And uh, that's the main point. In 1972, 73, and 74, we were engaged in fierce struggle with forces such as the October League, which came to be known as the Communist Party of the USA, Marxist Leninist. We were involved in serious struggle with what is known as the Revolutionary Union known as the Revolutionary Communist Party. You see the RCP from time to time uh, uh, today. In 1972, we were involved and struggled with different sectors of the African bourgeoisie in this country who represent themselves as leaders of the African liberation movement subsequent to the defeat of the revolution itself, who held themselves up as leaders when in fact they had been hostile to the actual manifestation of revolution as it actually existed in the world. So. It's not that we, we're involved in a new struggle or using a new tactic or strategy when we raise up ideological struggle within the movement, but there is something that is happening in the world now that makes this struggle different. Some of the things that we talked about earlier are being experienced differently now. We raise struggle with the Republic of New Africa and their five state line. We raise struggle with the All African People's Revolutionary Party, a struggle that had actually begun in 1977. But even though we raised those struggles then, there are some things which are occurring in the world now which makes these struggles more, more struggles more significant today. The US government has sharply escalated this attack against African people in this country. There is now the sharpest form of warfare occurring against African people. And I'm gonna make a point because 
These struggles that we raised were never personal. Stokely Carmichael, now known as, uh, when he died, known as Kwame Ture, was my friend. But he was wrong. And we raised ideological struggle. When, when I was in prison for snatching a mural off the wall in St. Petersburg uh, as a member of SNCC, and Stokely at the time was the chair of SNCC, the black churches in this city refused to allow Stokely to speak when he came to defend us, and I'm in jail here, when what is now, uh, what was then Florida Presbyterian and now Epic College uh, actually placed uh, some kind of $50,000, uh, 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 I forgot the legal term for it, uh, to prohibit him from coming, Stokely said, I'm coming, I'm coming if I, have to, if I have to walk the streets of the black community, I'm coming there. That was my man. You understand? But my love for Stokely Carmichael didn't prohibit me uh, from being able to make a criticism of a part of politic and ideology and philosophy that I knew was wrong in terms of leading our people. I didn't know it then. I developed. And, and Stokely still was my man. We participated still in, this, in, in common events, but I struggled with him. And he expected to be struggled with because that's the thing that gives life and dynamism and helps to make us better uh, and helps to raise the consciousness of masses of the people when we engage in these struggles so people can make choices based and form choices about what direction we have to move in. I'm gonna make that, I want to say that uh, I we struggle against the Republican New Africa. Uh, Imari Obadeli was the president of the, uh, of the so-called provisional government of New Africa. Uh, we knew Imari, and when he was jailed uh, for a heroic act that he and members of the RNA took uh, in defending themselves against FBI, and actually shot FBI agents, and the same organization which, uh, when they were raided in, in Detroit uh, at uh, Aretha Franklin's father's church, shot them up. They just comrades. But this, this, this was my man. He was jailed, and when he was freed from prison because he thought somebody was going to take his life, he called us to come pick him up, even though we had political and ideological difference, and have them today. And we'll make those struggles because they're wrong. It's not because of how we felt about them. It had nothing to do with us personally. It had to do with the future of our struggle. And this is the point that I want to make right now. I think it's extremely important because I want to rob this discussion of what may be some kind of subjective response that people have because that's how we are accustomed to struggling. Politics and our view, worldview are so limited. And everything is intense in the black community. Everything is intense. So an ideological political question is not just some abstract uh, that you uh, have the baby circles uh, to talk about. It's a life and death matter. Important to us and, 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 and too often people take these things subjectively because we have not developed politically. We haven't, our organization, the movement, have not even been allowed uh, to live long enough in, in most uh, instances to develop a certain kind of political maturity and experience. But the African People's Sources Party, we've been here for a while, and we've been developing, and we've been struggling, even after the Black Revolution of the 60s was defeated. So I just wanted to make that point. This attack includes what we call, uh, we say that, but even though we raised these struggles then, there are some things that are occurring in the world now which makes the struggles more significant today. For example, the, today the U.S. government has sharply escalated attacks against African people in this country. There, are, there is now the sharpest form of warfare occurring against African people. And this attack includes what we call, what we call strategic hamlets when we were talking about Vietnam. U.S. troops would come in, move whole villages, areas and surround them with barbed wire fences and military forces. They were called uh, protected villages in Rhodesia. Uh, uh, in protected villages. In, in Rhodesia they did the same thing. The same thing in Algeria. Today we look at television and read in the newspaper that the same thing is happening right now in Chattanooga and Southside Chicago. Projects are being surrounded by barbed wire, uh, barbed wire top fences. New police organizations are being mobilized in the name of the fighting against drugs uh, to contain African workers. Uh, passes are being given to the residents in the, of the projects, housing projects,
to make sure that no one who doesn't have a pass can enter. This means, of course, that men cannot enter because most of the projects are African women and children. Uh, by virtue of the fact that the state has made the separation of, fam of African men from their families a requirement for receiving the humiliating pittance that they call welfare. People like drug czar William Bennett and HUD uh, director Jack Kemp saying that these are going uh, that these there these are going to be the policies that will exist not only in places like Chattanooga and Chicago but all over the country. We see that uh, there is a situation where the U.S. government is saying that for the people who live in projects now, if there is any suspicions that they have anything to do with drugs, uh, users or pushers, be evicted without even having the benefit of the landlord favorable legal procedure, procedures that have existed in the past. Crystallization of reaction as it relates to African people inside this country. In addition to that, we see a growing movement throughout the world by all the forces of all nations and peoples who assume that they have a stake in the continuing existence of the current world system. They are lining up on the side of imperialism, attempting to whether it is the students who are in Tiananmen squares demanding the democratic right to bring an escalated imperialist penetration into China, or whether it is the government or party of China that is saying that the capitalist development in China should happen as a consequence of the bourgeois nationalists of China themselves having control of the situation. They are lining up on the side of imperialism. This is, this is different from the, this, this madness that you just saw on, with this man who calls himself Dr. Johnson, Dr. Umar Johnson. This is what we are talking about. We are talking about actual real conditions that exist in the world that confront African people. And what we have to do to take this on, this is the context within which we make this ideological struggle. Ideological struggle, not some personal assault on somebody, but ideological struggle. The same is true of the Soviet Union, which is now clearly attempting to enter into or deepen this alliance with imperialism to contain the struggles of the peoples of the world so that the economic situation in Russia can be more beneficial. And the same is true the left going into the rainbow coalition, the Democrats. Democratic Party, the women's movement, the anti-abortion movement, just as it is for the Zionists holding up the worst kind of terrible oppression of the people of Palestine. It's interesting uh, to watch the relationship most of these forces have to each other. How is possible for the same bourgeois media who love Chinese students in Tiananmen Square to not say a single word about the ongoing slaughter of the people in occupied Palestine? a single word about democracy as it relates to the aggression of African people that's happening inside this country today. We see a crystallization of forces which requires us to define what is revolu what revolution is. The organization required to make revolution. Can anything make the revolution? Is it that we have a whole bunch of people who are inspired to revolution and you just pick the one that you like the best? Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. <laughs> she loves me, she loves me not. Uh, or is there a way that we can approach the question that informs us and be made only under certain conditions, certain kinds of forces, and only with certain aims, and that we have to commit everybody to recognizing and struggling for that? That's what it is. We think that it's that's the way it has to be approached. And we think the question has to be approached now in particular. It's impossible for anybody to be, say, to be saying they believe in making revolution without having to deal with certain fundamental questions. The first and most fundamental question is the inherently parasitic nature of imperialism, of capitalism, as it has arisen in the world, a parasite. You cannot coexist with the parasite. There's nothing beneficial about it in regard to most human beings. The continuing survival of, ca of, of capitalism comes at the expense of the well-being of the vast majority of the people on the planet Earth. Even the struggle for the rights of white women within the context of protecting the ongoing existence of capitalism is reactionary. It is oppressive. Oppression of the majority of the people on the planet Earth. 
I could have listened all day to this thing that Mr. Johnson was doing. If he had engaged in some kind of political struggle that tries to define the reality that we're confronted with as a people and how we move forward. But that is not what happened. That's what we are doing today. Forces who would fight for the continuing existence of the system in order to get a piece of the action for themselves find themselves uniting with imperialism. These are the conditions. They are saying that, that I demand in order to continue to unite with the oppression of the rest of the people. <coughs> Inside our movement, this phenomenon occurs too. About recently, when we talk about the Republic of New Africa an organization that assumes for itself the governmental authority of all the oppressed African people in this country, that assumes for itself the legitimacy of state power over black people, and in the past has made the assumption that the U.S. government is an illegitimate colonial government that has to be replaced by it. What a magnificent... When we have such an organization as this coming forward saying that we will get men with guns to fight against African youngsters throughout this country in defense of what the government has said is the most important question, which is the drug problem among African people. They are lining up with imperialism. Of this discussion, this criticism, it's not, it's not something personal between me and the RNA or the African People's Social Party and the RNA or me and uh, Imari Obadeli. The existence of a provision of government for black people makes the assumption that the fundamental question, this is what the, the, the RNA, a provision of government, is, its existence makes the assumption that the fundamental question is a foreign and alien government over black people. That's the question. Therefore, the fundamental problem can't be the fact that African people use drugs. In fact, African people use drugs because there's a foreign... Uh, government that dominates us. And every question has to be subordinate to the revolution. Question is subordinate to acquiring our own power. The RNA, RNA says to the U.S. government, you should give us what they call reparations, not because we uh, do reparations for 200 years of free labor, not, be, uh, ju not just because the Japanese got reparations, but because we can use the money. In other words, they liquidate the political basis for there being an antagonistic contradiction between the masses of African people and the U.S. government. Respo reparations has nothing to do with the political question. It says, or at least it does, it, or, or if it does, or at least if it does, it's subordinate to the fact that we need the money. Yes. That's why we point out that there is something wrong. There's a form of opportunism involved here that is a betrayal of revolution. The president of the, of the RNA, Imam Obadele, has not built a reparations organization, but a reparations lobbying group. He says that we need an army of true men who are willing to fight against African youth. He says we need reparations because we have to have a full-blown strategy that involves resources, not because of a political contradiction, but because we need the money. To do what? To deal with the drug problem. That's what he puts out. Not to transform the actual conditions of our people so that we can be free of a hostile and alien power, but to deal with the drug problem and all the other quote unquote ills that beset us, he says. We don't have a situation where ills beset us in the African community. We don't have a situation where ills beset us. Omar Obadella says that our strategy includes resources and includes true men with guns to deal with the young Africans who are involved in a penny ante way in the drug trade because that's all they are involved in. It's a penny ante way to get to the African community in the real sense. He says our national strategy, strategy should be love, in quotes, combined with retribution for, uh, quote, the unreconstructed lawless ones, unquote. And we should do this by, quote, using the structures of the U.S. state as it exists today. That's what he said. I'm quoting him. I quoted him last week. 
when we read more extensively from his statement. That's what the talk, that's where the talk gets funny. In other words, what we need is love and resources, reparations, not because there's a fundamental political contradiction between us and the U.S. colonial system, but because we need the money to deal with the drug question, which is what the U.S. government defines as the fundamental problem for African people. Men, not to deal with the government, but to deal with what Bush said, what Ron Wilson Reagan's ugly wife said, is the most fundamental problem, the drug problem. I did use a subjective characterization. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guilty. <laughs> so we need resources, reparations, men with guns to kill black people. And we need, this is where the talk gets funny, retribution for the unreconstructed lawless ones using the structures of the state as it exists today. This is the guy who's going to lead us out of this madness. We say that's no revolution. You can't put that forward. You can put that forward if you want to, but you can't do it in the name of a revolution. We have to make these statements and these struggles because I am not the only one who heard him say that. There are masses of uninformed. Uh, an ill-informed African people who hear this, and he tries to lead them, and I'm trying to lead them. So the question is whether they will be led uh, to fighting a war uh, with young Africans uh, uh, using the, the, the mechanism of the state as it exists today, or whether they will fight against imperialism to destroy the system as it exists, the structures of the state as it exists today. That's the question that we're confronted with. Question that we're confronted with because we have concluded the only way out of this uh, is revolution. Uh, just as you didn't vote, we didn't vote our way into the situation, we won't be able to vote our way out of it. Pray our way into the situation, we won't be able to pray our way out of it. Just as drugs didn't get us here, fighting against drugs won't get us out of it. The problem is colonialism. Throw a foreign and alien alien entity that carries out its will against our will. An alien entity requires for its existence the oppression of our people. So we make this extraordinarily clear today, particularly as there's a huge concentration of forces around the world who would move against the ability of the poor and oppressed people to change the relationship that we have to imperialism. We have to make these struggles. We have to make them now. And even the struggles we made in the past with these same forces take on a different significance. Somebody asks, well, why are we involved in this struggle right now? We have to be involved in this struggle right now because we have to solve all the problems of the revolution. On these questions, we can't move forward. When we say who the Republic of New Africa is, we are saying at the same time who we are. When we say who the All African People's Revolutionary Party is, we also say who we are. That's a part of the process that we unleash here. A part of the struggle that did not get resolved in the 60s when the African Liberation Movement split tendencies. These two broad tendencies represented the anti-colonial black power, pro-independence, uh, tendency on the one hand, and on the other hand, the tendency that we call the integrationists, the, cap the capitulationists, the lick spittles, see, subjective. <laughs> <laughs> the vast majority of the African masses in this country united with the black power tendency. There is no doubt about that. That is why it became necessary for J. Edgar Hoover to construct a program designed to get rid of what he called black nationalist hate groups. And that's why they put it in motion an actual war against African people in this country. Inside the pro-independence black power anti-colonial camp, a thousand different currents existed under the same banner. Forces such as Floyd McKissick from the Congress of Racial Equality, who united with Richard Nixon's ideas that we needed, what we needed was black capitalism. McKissick believed uh, that was the way uh, for power and entered into some kind of program that consolidated something called Soul City in South Carolina. On the other hand, we had the Black Panther Party and the remnants of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. We had all kinds of different currents existing under a single banner, class interests and aspirations. 
but the struggle to distinguish who was who. The most fundamental political questions, the opportunity to get settled. There were a lot of accounts left unsettled at the time that the African Revolution was crushed inside this country. You see what I'm saying? These, these were swirling issues and debates to some extent that were happening uh, that they did not get resolved because the government crushed the movement before these discussions and struggles could play themselves out effectively. Movement, they didn't crush us. I mean, it was extremely difficult and, and we had to work under extraordinary circumstances, but we continued to struggle. Now, as we attempt to move forward, many people are trapped in their understanding of what we're trying to do based on where we were in the 60s. They reach back in their memories and grab something that which seemed to be happening in the 60s, and they raise that up as significant. Lines have become so blurred precisely because the government's aggression against the black power, anti-colonial or pro-independence tendency. Now the U.S. government has raised up as leadership of the African people, the integrationists. Forces like Jesse Jackson, Lionel Wilson, uh, Wilson Good, Leo Brazil, and Wilson Riles, who were in power, uh, who were put in power by the guns of the U.S. government, the guns that took the Black Panther Party out of power in the city of Oakland and other places around this country. And also the guns that took uh, Martin Luther King out and the guns that took Malcolm X out. That's how the ascendancy of some people who uh, into what was called leadership uh, was facilitated by the U.S. government's assault on the liberation movement in this country. The revolutionary movement was replaced by the gun, and it's fundamentally important to understand that. Put it up, and 20 years later, we find Jesse Jackson, who has the ability to pose as a revolutionary simply because he existed in the 60s. The force in a tendency that was favored by U.S. imperialism. Before, before its destruction, the movement had begun to grapple with the question of what it takes to free ourselves. The only thing we have to have is a revolutionary organization, not just an organization involved in protesting the question or, or, or talking about integration, but an organization designed to capture political power. The power of a foreign, alien, and hostile state. It's the people of slavery in the first place. We need to have an organization that is designed to get rid of that. That's what we are talking about. We want to have a revolution. We can't get out of this without revolution. If we're going to have revolution, then we have to have a particular kind of organization. We can't have an organization like Boy Scouts, for example, an organization like the Glee Club, for example. We can't have an organization like the Democrats or Republicans. You have to have a special kind of organization. It has to be, it's got to be a revolutionary organization to make a revolution. Guess what else you need? You need revolutionaries who are organized around certain principles. These, those principles under the leadership of a revolutionary organization subordinate every other question to the revolution. Every question is subordinate to the revolution. Every question is the vehicle for making the revolution. The revolutionary party is the vehicle for making the revolution. Every effort, therefore, to strengthen the revolutionary, every effort is to, therefore, is to strengthen the revolutionary party. Every effort, effort is for the revolutionary party to become the leadership of the masses around every question. Every question must be subordinate to the revolution. There must be an organization of men and women whose profession is revolution. They might be plumbers, they might be school teachers, they might have other, any other kind of occupation, but their profession is revolution. So when they plumb, they plumb in a revolutionary fashion that promotes the revolution. And when they teach, they teach in a, in a way that promotes the revolution. They organize on the job wherever they are, for the purpose of the revolution. Every question is important. There is not a single question that can be free of the question of making the revolution. Now, the Glee Club is not like that. But, uh, neither is the Boy Scouts, nor the Democratic Party. The question then for a revolutionary party is not simply an organizational question. It is an ideological question as well. And to the revolutionary party are organized around certain principles with the understanding that, the fu that to function in this fashion is necessary if we are going to make a revolution. 
So as revolutionaries, we have to clarify a lot of questions. Let's see. Uh, on the one hand, we have to clarify among all the organizations and groups out there, the fact that there are not just a whole bunch of revolutionaries and you pick the one you like. The fact is there's a correct line and there's an incorrect line in the world. What it clarifies that inside the party, there are different lines running wild, raging for domination. We're talking about inside the African People's Socialist Party. There is a line that requires us to function in a certain way, guided by certain principles in order to carry out the task of the revolution. It's every question to the revolution inside the party. On the other hand, there's another line that's constantly seeking shortcuts that won't use the structures and procedures and processes put in place for the purpose of making this revolution through this organization, which is capable of carrying out the revolution. That happens inside our party as well. The struggle that's raging now is raging in the world and it's going down inside the party. Building and consolidating the party happens within the context of this struggle. Those forces inside the party who work against the party functioning as it should function represent another line. It is not a revolutionary line in the context of the world that we live in where neo-colonialism reigns supreme. It's important for us to understand that we're not just talking about some disagreements. There are political lines struggling for dominance. If you look at what, how some people treat the party and responsibilities, and if we follow that line, we go nowhere. Our, 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 our organizations would deteriorate, our institutions would founder, uh, uh, our development uh, of a cadre uh, would be nothing. We follow that line. And these are the two tendencies that's being struggled. That, and we, we experience them inside the party all the time. Um, and people sometimes get subjective about it and feel bad about it. Feel bad about a critique, a criticism. Uh, in fact, people should feel good about a criticism because that's the only way you can get to what the source of the contradiction is and fix it. And even if it means replacing me, in fact, I look forward to it if it's going to advance the revolution because it ain't about me. It's not about you. It's about making this revolution and doing everything that we can to perfect it the mechanism, the vehicle necessary for making a revolution. Perfecting the political line, perfecting the ideology to make sure that we can make this revolution. It's not about us as individuals. And that's the trap that, that we come into this work with because we've been outside of real African life for so long. If life for so long, uh, this whole individualism and the structures of the society itself are such that it promotes individualism and self-centeredness, uh, and so that we as individuals become the most significant thing in the universe, as opposed to our people, our community. Uh, that's the kind of thing that we're confronted with, but we will make the struggle. This is the first day of the year, and this is going to be incredibly, in, in, incredibly important for us. So we say, neo-colonialism is the most important strategical component of the counterinsurgency against African workers forces inside the party who are struggling against the party carrying out revolutionary principles. They are trying to uphold neo-colonialism. Practically speaking, that's what you're talking about. That's the kind of thing that we have to begin to come to grips with and struggle against. See, we're not just talking about the Republic of New Africa and the five states people. We're not just talking about the all African people. We're talking about the African People's Socialist Party too. There are contradictions in our midst, and these contradictions have to be dealt with if we're going to move forward. How the party functions, uh, what it's supposed to carry out, we're not talking about an organizational question as such. We're talking about an ideological question because neo-colonialism is in our ranks, and we're trying to hold, and it's trying to hold everything back to keep us from overturning neo-colonialism. That's the practical consequence of what we have in the party. And this is important too, because this was written, uh, this presentation was made in 1989. We were involved in the same struggle in 2017. What's that, 28 years. We've been 
involved in this struggle because we have to perfect making the revolution to freeing our people. We have to perfect ourselves. The most important struggle that we're involved in is the struggle with self. Uh, and because neocolonialism resides in our brains and our spirits too often, uh, and not just that, a certain kind of social and political inertia, but things have just been happening a certain way for a long time, and that you just ride in that direction, whether you intend to or not. That's just the, the way it happens. And we have to break out of that. That's what leadership is all about. That's why people in the party have to be bold and assume the responsibility for leadership, lead out of this place where we are today. If we do this, then we'll change the course of history. That's the thing that we're confronting. That's why we're having this discussion right now. So we say two lines, the neo-colonialist line versus the revolutionary African internationalist line exist side by side in the park. They demonstrate themselves in different forms and different fashions. It's been going on for a long time. It's not a new struggle. Some people will remember that immediately before the struggle with the renegades inside the party, the last party document that we presented to the world said that things could not continue to exist in the party as they were. We said it's time for the people in the party to grow up. So that we called it building and consolidating the party as such. But one thing we said was that the party and members of the party had to function in a different way. But it didn't happen that way. Instead, inside the party, bourgeois feminist and lesbian separatist line, which is the petty bourgeoisie inside the ranks of the party, attacked the party, tried to hold it back and keep it in a, in a keep us as a neo-colonialist place, as opposed to a revolutionary place. We can say that every time we make certain kinds of changes, it creates a certain centrifugal force that flings off a lot of forces. And we are going to lose some forces. And it is part of the whole process of fighting for the revolution, fighting for the revolution in the party and in the world. In 1976, we identified various North American forces who were friends of the African People's Socialist Party, of the Hunter Militant Organizations, JOMA. We pulled them together in St. Petersburg, Florida, to build the African People's Solidarity Committee, APSC. At the first meeting, we said that we were trying to create a country type organization to do certain kinds of things in solidarity with the Black Revolution. Everybody agreed on it in that meeting. There were a lot of people in that meeting from California, Kentucky, Maine, Massachusetts, New York, and other places that I can't even remember. At the meeting, that's what we were going to do. This happened in the context of the Black Revolution having been defeated and the question of revolutionary organization have been pushed out off the place of history. Liberalism, opportunism, and various other forms of reaction now dominated the whole political situation in this country. And what we are talking about is we look at today, we look at Mr. Johnson, even stuff like the Black Lives Matter and all of it, we're looking at something that started a long time ago. This is the struggle we were making then. Well, what it takes to make a revolution, a revolution that come under assault. And other kinds of stuff were put forward uh, in, in response to the defeat of the revolution. They, they wouldn't have had a place. They, they could have even been um, in any place on the scene uh, during the height of the revolutionary movement. There was no place for them then. It took the defeat of the revolution. Listen, I mean, Mr. Johnson, uh, uh, the prince of pan-Africanism, what have you. Then what does he represent? There's, what is his movement? What is his organization? What's the name of it? What has he ever done? What's his practice? For forces like that, they couldn't claim some kind of leadership. The only way they can claim it is because the government killed the revolution and pushed it out of place. And these are vermin that sort of fill in the spaces and what have you. They call themselves revolution, revolutionary. They don't even call themselves revolutionary. And even during this struggle, that we were having, uh, there were organizations like New African uh, People's Organization, they didn't even talk about socialism. We forced them. Same struggle that we are reporting now, because there are two social systems, one's capitalist and one's social. You don't need to be capitalist or socialist. We forced them to have to say that through this kind of struggle, and that's what 
makes this kind of struggle good because it forces us to take positions, to take correct positions. It doesn't allow us to, to just exist in isolation. We can say and be whatever we want to be without some kind of contention. So we contend with that political line. And as a consequence of that, we raise up the level of political and ideological development inside the whole movement. That's why you have to have it. But how was that, how would me saying something about somebody in the RNA was shorter than me, uh, lighter than me, or they thought they were important when I'm the real chief of the thing, how would that have advanced anything? It wouldn't. And that's the difference in what we're talking about, and that's what I'm hoping the brother who was concerned about our criticizing somebody was somehow was disrespectful or some, something to that effect. Them as individuals. So we say, uh, and we're talking about uh, the existence uh, and the meeting that we had to organize the uh, APSC and said that this happened in the context of the Black Revolution having been defeated and the question of revolutionary organization having been pushed off the, uh, the place of history, liberalism, opportunism, and various other forms of reaction now dominated the whole political situation in this country within this context. And we were struggling against white forces who were supposedly building their own party. For example, there was a mass party organizing committee, MPOP. Uh, within, within the context of struggling with them, we can organize North Americans better than that. We can organize white people better than this white group. That was part of the struggle against an ossified liberalism and opportunism out there. The forces who initially were able to unite with the party assumed that they were uniting with the same old opportunist type of organization that was out there in the world. Some people come into the party using their own experiences as the basis of what to expect inside the party. They think that we're just Facebook uh, um, administrators, uh, social media people who go to an occasional demonstration block traffic and say Black Lives Matter and hashtag this and hashtag that. And so they come into the party expecting that kind of existence. Uh, so we said that uh, these forces from North American forces, they came to St. Petersburg, Florida, where the party had a conference to build a cadre type organization of North Americans who were in solidarity with the struggle for black revolution. Everybody at the meeting agreed that's what we were going to do. That agreement lasted for about eight hours after everybody left St. Petersburg, Florida. Then the phone began to jump off the hook. People called from all over the country saying that they had spoken too soon. They really couldn't participate in the revolutionary cadre type formation. Since then, that's been one of the most important struggles inside APFC. We understood that uh, uh, within the North American community, the ability to have solidarity with the African liberation movement. If you don't have solidarity, with the African liberation movement in this country, we cannot, you cannot be a legitimate force. At that time, we didn't know uh, too much else. We knew that the sons and daughters of the slave masters say that they are progressive and are going to be involved in progress and revolution in Vietnam, and they can support struggles in South America, South Africa, and they can support struggles anywhere. But their main, their maid is some nigger who is un underpaid, and they don't even want to be free inside this country. Here are the sons and daughters of the slave masters, and everything they have is a part of this, of the legacy of slavery. Everything is a part of the inheritance of slavery, and they don't even want to join with the people who did all this for them, raised them, held them to the breast, and let them suck the nipple. After all that, they can support everything under the freedom everything except the freedom of black people. We said these MFs must be out of their minds. <laughs> there ain't no, that ain't no revolution, and everybody knew it was no revolution. Revolution, but they know the real question is right here. Mysterious forces popping up in El Salvador. Mysterious forces popping up in Vietnam. It is important. It is imperialism, the worst imperialism that the world has ever known, the worst capitalism that the world has ever known, right here inside the US, not in South Africa, but right here. The South African government couldn't last 30 days if it weren't for US imperialism. Everybody knows 
knows that, but they root it because to deal with this deals with the essence of every question right here. We knew that there were some forces who wanted to have some kind of unity with Africans right here, who wanted to break from opportunism. They created for us the basis of pulling the meeting together. That created for us the basis of pulling the meeting together and making the struggle to form APSC. That was one aspect of the struggle. We knew that there was something wrong with the stance of the general North American left. They would put the struggle of black people in an auxiliary, secondary place that somehow was supposed to keep the white work, let help the white workers seize the means of production. The trickle down theory that Africans would get the benefit of the white workers seizing power. That was weird. We couldn't go with that one. Next thing we knew we'd have to be carrying mint juleps again. So we said no. We knew something was wrong with that politic. Y'all don't know what mint julep is, but that's another story. <laughs> Then, in the process of developing the land around North American solidarity, the question began to sharpen. We still had to ask the question, how do North Americans make the revolution? Is it simply that all the white workers get together and then understand the role of black workers as some kind of auxiliary? Is it that the white workers must solve what they call the national question and then we make the revolution? Is it, is, what is it that makes the revolution? So in this whole process of struggle, the question became clearer and clearer to us. It also became clearer to us that any old organizational form won't do. We haven't always known as much as we know now, and we don't know now as much as we'll know in a couple of weeks from now. That's the truth of the matter. There was a time when our party, in our party, when we had concluded that these white folks were not going to do what is needed to make the revolution. It just ain't going to happen. There was a lot of opportunism up in APSC fighting against what we were trying to do, fighting against what everybody said we were about. That was happening. Struggles were being raised up inside the solidarity movement. Then one night, Comrade Penny Hess called uh, on the telephone and said, uh, can I come over uh, to the office at 611 Hay Street in San Francisco? She came over and said, that's where we were based at the time. I'm in the process of being evicted because the struggle is getting heavy. We had sitting on the floor in the collective house at 611 Hay Street, the struggle inside APSC took a leap. For the first time, we heard coming back at us our own understanding of what the contradiction was. That was the thing that made it possible for us to fight then for what APSC could be and what the North American people could have as a part of, and what the North American people could have as a part of the revolutionary process. Then it came to a new point. People began to fight for that land. And it resolved, revolved around what we now characterize as citizens' reparations, end quote. The key to everything had to be the question of material solidarity. If you aren't talking about material solidarity and you're white, you're just talking mess. <laughs> if you aren't talking about material solidarity here with the African Revolution, when everything we need to make the revolution is in your community, by virtue of the structural relationship that we have, then you're just talking. Because how can my revolutionary organization over here compete with what you're trying to do in, to control it when everything I need for my revolution is in your community? It has been appropriated from me. In fact, the basis of my need to make the revolution. The consolidation of APSC was a fundamental new place for the whole world. The Achilles heel of U.S. imperialism has been nicked. That was the fundamental question. Never before has that occurred inside this country. Then the struggle inside APSC began to happen with, and this was the land that was trying to hold up revolutionary internationalism for North Americans. It became clear that the relationship that we had between the party and the African People's Solidarity Committee was the correct organizational form that was needed to make a revolution. White people can't make a revolution outside of that because if you try, what happens is that the material basis of opportunism, genes, not some other factor, but the material basis of how the world economy is structured always interferes and then takes white people off on their own trip. So if you're going to make a revolution, then you've got to make a revolution based on how <coughs> we have set up the structure between the African People's Socialist Party and the African People's Solidarity Committee. But the fact of the matter is everything must be subordinate to the revolution. One trying to hold up revolution 
and the other land fighting against it in a million different ways all down the land. That's the context that we are talking about. One land holds up revolutionary African internationalism and independent of its will, the other land holds up neo-colonialism. So, let's see. I know everybody's eager to talk about this and we have, we can have some discussion. And uh, before we get to the discussion, what I would like to do is just to go through the roll call and see who's come on since we, uh, Black, since it began. So we have uh, Dihan, uh, Ona, Mike Love, Ruby, Unique, Timba, <coughs> Penny, Chimaranga, Ali, Kitty, Kefing, Elikia, uh, Bedora, Star, uh, Janice, Makta, Taylor, Opa, Ajani, and who else? Jackson. Jackson. Ntamwe. Fasia. Who is that person? Kunde. Oh, Kunde. Uhuru. Kunde. Anyone else? I'm sorry. Kalunda. Rafiq. Anyone else? Okay. So I want to open it up. Uh, I want to ask people, though, uh, if you're not speaking to please um, mute. And I really uh, hope that, uh, that uh, people are as excited about this discussion as I am. Uh, for me, this is really an exciting discussion, and I hope that people will let's, uh, let's uh, have this discussion. So, Uhuru, anybody? Um, I, really, I really just wanted to be like what you said with what you said. Who is about. this? Who is this? Sorry, this is Taylor. Yes, Taylor, go ahead. About how spending um, money to dealing to, you know, how people are asking for reparations to deal with the drug problem in our community um, is just, you know, spending that same money to put black people into prison because we haven't really found a way to deal with the drug community or to deal with drugs in our community. You know, there's no, like, support system. It's always just revolving around putting people into prison and locking people up for what they do instead of providing opportunities to, you know, give them an alternative to selling drugs or, you know, putting them into kind of, like, programs or something, whatever, just to, to actually deal with the problem instead of putting people in the prison. I think that's right, but I want to extend it beyond that. Uh, because even uh, to talk about it within the context of having good drug programs uh, does not get to the essential question. And the question is that even those people on drugs need to be brought into a revolutionary movement. And that the cure for what happens with us is revolution. There are not enough drug treatment houses. What is it that drives uh, people into drug use uh, anyway? And uh, what is it that you have a system that denies people even work in a legal capitalist economy and then place, imposes a drug economy on your community? So what we're saying is that the greater question, not drug programs, uh, but uh, even though that's an issue, you know, as you know, you see what's happening now when all the white people are getting uh, uh, addicted to, uh, to prescription drugs and heroin and what have you, now they discover that uh, it's a health problem. But it's not a health problem. For us. It's a political problem. It's a question of power. Who has the power? Who has the power to determine whether people can eat, uh, whether people can be secure in their communities and things like that? And that's imperialism, white power, colonialism. So what we're saying is that when you talk about reparations to set up drug programs even, you're missing the boat. Reparations uh, have to facilitate our ability to break free of white power altogether. The biggest drug program you can have is revolution. And, and that's the point that we want to make right now. That other than that, you subordinate the whole question about freedom to some kind of jive time program. Uh, and that's the thing that contributes to what we call opportunism. Because opportunism is sacrificing the long-term interests of the people of the African working class uh, for the benefit of some kind of sh short-term thing, short-term uh, gain. And obviously there's some short-term thing that's going to be with drug programs. And the, the ones who benefit mostly from the drug programs are the ones who run them. 
And the more people are on drugs, the more beneficial it is to them. So it's only in the interest of our community and our, and especially African working class, to eradicate drugs altogether. And you eradicate drugs uh, through revolution. You eradicate drugs by having a, 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 a an imperialist eradication um, program. And that's what the revolution and the party are about. Uhuru. Anybody else? Come on, comrades. I want to extend this discussion. I think this is very good. I think that was a very good and important observation that was just made by Taylor. This is the point that I'm making. Essentially, this is the point that I'm making. Because uh, if you, we are a place in history where it appears uh, that many forces in the whole world uh, have concluded that the revolution is not happening, that the world is always going to be this way, white people are always going to be in power, we just have to find a good place in it, a more comfortable place in it, the more make white power more amenable uh, as opposed to eradicating it from the planet Earth. You know, uh, it's responsible for the great misery that everybody experiences. I want to hear from y'all. I don't believe this. Uhuru Mafika. Yeah, I really want to appreciate the study. Uh, one thing that when you were reading the thing about the RNA and their position on how to get rid of drugs and why they should get reparations, I was struck by the fact that they said the U.S. state the method by which they would punish but they claim it to be the provisional government over all the black people. I was struck by that. I, I had never heard any, but I was struck by the fact that they would even say, use the U.S. state as the method by which you control the black people, although we claim to be the government of the black people. Uh, well, that's part of what I'm talking about. If your long-term aim, then how do you ask the white people to come in and have powers uh, some more? When by, by your very act, you're reinforcing the colonial domination of African people. That is opportunism. Can't you envision being able to have the power yourself? Uh, comrade. Yes, go ahead. I thought I heard someone. <clears throat> Timber, go ahead. Yeah, I got um, a couple of questions uh, from Facebook and one from uh, YouTube. I don't know if people can hear you. Yeah. You got a Facebook and YouTube question. Yeah, go ahead. Facebook and YouTube question. Uh, this is Margin Sete. Se Se okay, so for reparations, how about we create a core central facility? facility system from our movement. We demand a certain amount, uh, keep moving. Uh, we demand a certain amount if core money assets we control from business ourselves, similar to welfare, but it's not welfare, have, have a photo ID, etc., to keep, uh, to keep of how money each individual gets business owners get more, I don't know if you're understanding this. <laughs> well, I just think the point continues yeah. to be missed. Yeah. For us, reparation is a function of the revolution. It's an important, incredibly significant demand. And one thing that makes it important uh, is the fact that almost everybody from all different uh, sections of the African community can unite with it. So that's a great start, great beginning. And uh, almost everybody who talks about revolution from their perspective, their class, and other perspectives uh, have a different understanding about what should that mean and where it should go. That's all right, too. Uh, but as revolutionaries, we see reparations as a function of the revolution. And the thing that's so powerful about it is because it's, it, it removes this onus that has been imposed on the African community, that this slander, that somehow uh, black people on welfare and black people are living off the welfare, white people, et cetera. And it, it takes the covers off the reality that white people have been living off the welfare of African people for more than 400 years. And that uh, it emboldens African people. Once the concept is grasped, it emboldens African people 
And we're going to see all kinds of movement toward that, not just by organizations, but by individuals. I mean, think about this. All these African people who have uh, gone uh, to court uh, for all kinds of uh, causes. Uh, uh, think about young Africans who are standing up in front of a judge now who have been accused of stealing this or stealing that and looking at the judge straight in the eye and being able to say, we know who the real thieves are. You stole everything. You stole my future. You know, a hundred years ago, you stole my future. You stole my parents. You stole every damn thing I've got. The whole si the system won't be able to tolerate that. And our objective as revolutionary is to break the system down, not to find a way to live better within it. So we might, that's reformism, reforms, because uh, we work with the Black is Back Coalition and, uh, and we work uh, with the uh, independent, uh, well, the actual uh, NPDM, the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement, is, a, is a, a party organization. And some of the work that we do is reform, but it's reform that gives us a higher platform to stand on to make revolution. Reform is not the end concept of and as it's not that might be good for some kind of reformist program i don't know but the discussion we're having now is about revolution and how you would have an organization that has already been mentioned that presumes for itself the authority of government we are the black government that's what they say that's what they say we are the provisional government of the republic of new africa but we want the white people's uh, government to do it. That's ridiculous. And that's opportunism that we're talking about. So we're not making a distinction between any idea about how to get reparations and our idea. We're making a distinction uh, between revolution that we say is the only way that will solve our problem. And then the tactics and strategies to make a revolution. Revolution is a science and an art. We're making a distinction between revolution and opportunism. That's the struggle that we're engaged in right now. Uhuru. Anybody else? You got some more? Yeah, it's funny that you should say uh, revolution is a science. Um, ask the children to please go over what revolution is a science means. It means that uh, as a science, uh, we went over some of what we're talking about in terms of uh, in order to make a revolution, there's certain kinds of requirements that have to exist. You can't make a revolution just because you want it to happen is coups where a military group can overthrow another uh, thing and take power. Uh, uh, but a revolution uh, in, in, implies uh, the participation of masses of the decisive sector of the population in order for it to happen. It uh, anticipates the breakdown of social order, crisis in the social system. We said that's absolutely necessary. The inability of the ruling class to rule in the same old way. These are some of the objective things that are necessary. Uh, and we say that, uh, that the people have to have come to certain kind of conclusions, that they're willing to fight and d defy any odds. They don't, don't want to, Malcolm X said, they don't want to hear you or Uncle Tom's talking about the odds are against us. You know, uh, they're ready to take it on. And we've seen circumstances where the people are willing. We saw that in Ferguson, where there at least a handful of people in Ferguson were willing to take it. That has to be generalized. That's the responsibility of the party to generalize that. So that assumption is broadly among masses of people and everybody, you know, has the same uh, kind of feeling. And, and then we talk about uh, the need, uh, the science of revolution requires us to know that there has to be a revolutionary vehicle and the party is the revolutionary vehicle. The party is an organization that's absolutely necessary because we want not just protest bad things, but you want to uh, you want to defeat the state. You want to seize power from an oppressor and then you need the ability to exercise power once that's done. That's why even as we move toward this revolution, we're creating all these institutions. We're creating, you know, we've got stores, we've got certain kinds of uh, economic uh, institutions and things like that moving forward. Uh, and so, because we plan to govern, and that's part of what it is that we're talking about. So revolution means that we have to have the science and the technique to overturn the social system, we have to be able to understand what it is that keeps this thing held together and see it breaking down. We made, a, uh, 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 in 2013, I think it was, at our sixth Congress, uh, we defined the period uh, that we live in as an uneasy equilibrium. Science to be able to see that. It takes science, that's, your, your theory has to be based on science. Scientific theory, advanced revolutionary theory, 
is absolutely necessary. And your theory based on science helps you to understand what holds it together. Therefore, you can see what's breaking, how it's breaking down. It ain't breaking down just because you're mad. It ain't breaking down because everybody in your community is mad. But there are other things that hold this thing together. You can see it breaking down. When you see 17 people in the Republican Party, and maybe, maybe it's five from the Democratic Party, all contesting for uh, the nomination of their political party, when you recognize, scientifically, you understand that an election uh, in this country and the white world is nothing but a nonviolent contest between different sectors of the white ruling class for control of the state, what you know you're recognizing is the whole ruling class is split. 19, at least 25 ways. And then when you see an election that happens where people think that the only way to come to power legitimately in this country is through the electoral process and 100 million people don't vote, and the people who they have to vote for have negative ratings of over 50%, each of them, then you're looking at a split and divided thing, and that informs you in terms of, uh, that's the science of revolution, being able to recognize that and how to take advantage of those circumstances and building cadre people who are soldiers, uh, who are capable of finding a way and making this revolution happen. The science, and the science is the kind of organization that you need to make revolution. You know, revolution don't happen because you wish for it. You, you have to have a certain kind of organization. That's the kind of organization we built in the African People's Social Party. And I probably didn't do justice to the question, but that's, that's what we can do within a few seconds. Uhuru. Go ahead, comrade. Is there another you have? No. Is there anybody else? Any, any, anybody else? Uhuru. Uhuru. Yeah, uh, I was wondering when I hear from you. <laughs> Yeah, I want to just comment on the uh, on the comrade's criticism of uh, uh, of the people who 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 he considered uh, warriors that were criticized uh, 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 about the party. But the same one that happened here. I look at the big picture is 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 needed because um, if you would look at the same people that this comrade is talking about, <laughs> you would see to the outside world. Uh, was through the pages of the Burning Steel newspaper. Yeah. Not only that, they had to appear to do the right. Uh, uh, that people spoke in our forums, our uh, our uh, 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 our mass meetings. Uh, so, uh, and, and even as they wrote inside the Burning Steel newspaper, we were making the same criticism that we make it. That um, that you know that we make it now. Uh, and you know. What it served to do was, was, was uh, sharpen the question, advance, um, even what the party has been able to do because if the party had not raised those questions, um, 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 yeah, it would not be at the state that it was in. I don't know in what the government in the when, uh, 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 when it took to Omega Stumpers uh, uh, group, that, uh, uh, when Paul made no aid group, the ADRP, uh, and you know, we, we you know, people come out hard, but in the final analysis, that served to advance the whole movement. But, you know, my point is that if you, if you will see who upheld those comrades, the many, many people we had in trying to get these comrades out of the situation, we even tried to build a build, uh, dead build of uh, uh, that's when I just built an organization to address this problem. That you raise it now because you did come back from the world too. Now, that's what's the most personal about it. Nothing personal. In fact, uh, as Kay Fing was just mentioning, I mean, uh, ours was the only forum that all of them had a place to speak to. They were all, we invited them out. There was a Burning Spear newspaper. We were the only one that had a, a reliable, ongoing uh, publication. And what was striking uh, also is that when we made the criticisms of uh, AAPRP, they would deflect the, the issue. They would say sometimes some personal thing between me and Kwame or Stokely. Uh, or, you know, uh, they would say it created something that uh, the party, uh, the African People's Social Party, tried to uh, initiate a revolution in Syria. And uh, they were opposed to it, and that was the basis of some 
of, of these struggles. So they would not even deal with the political issues that were being raised. And that's what's, it, it's really important for our people and our organizations to be able to discern uh, the political questions because they would not deal with the political. They said, well, some issue, I didn't say anything personal about Kwame or Stokely or uh, it was a political question that I raised. And then they want to say that it has to do with, uh, with some personal stuff. And that happened all the time. In fact, uh, when we made the criticism of, of, uh, of uh, uh, the new African, the Afri new Africanist tendency, uh, uh, you know, uh, one of his leaders uh, said something uh, that if we had a criticism, we should just call him up on the phone and say something to them about it. And just something that I had to, to do with that person. It was the fact that there was a political line out there that we had to make a contest with it in order to, to arm the masses of people so that we could advance a revolutionary movement, a revolutionary struggle. Tell me you said something. Yeah, Wait. we have a um, young brother off Facebook. Um, does fighting to liberate five states in the South contribute to weakening white power? Possibly. It could possibly lead to, it, it contributes to a fracturing of the state. So there's no question about that helping to, to weaken white power. But the other question, outstanding question, is that what about the indigenous peoples here whose land, who suffer what they suffer precisely because their land has been taken? So, so if we end up uh, making this five state struggle with the assumption that somehow it's ours because we picked cotton here a long time ago, then what we uh, inadvertently do, and most times it would be inadvertently, uh, we end up uh, uniting with the uh, ongoing uh, uh, settler colonial domination of the indigenous peoples here. And, and, and they suffer precisely uh, because of the near genocidal assault and the, and the theft of their land and resources. Look at what's happening in North Dakota right now so severe that people don't even fight about it in the context of the land of the indigenous people. They're, the white people, hippies and uh, white people out there talking about how it's going to spoil the, the, the environment. Hell, the environment was spoiled the first time a white settler put his, put his foot on the ground here and began to start doing all this stuff. And so it's colonialism. It's, it's, it's settler colonialism. And so that's the, that's the weakness. That's what we call opportunism. Not because it won't, won't, won't do, do, do something to uh, affect uh, white power, but because uh, if you can find up, uh, find yourself with an evil black power dominating indigenous land, and that's not, we got a homeland. So why would you, you got 12 million square miles of resources that have been stolen from us every day. Why sell from Mississippi, you know, when you've got the whole continent of Africa that's, that's there, that belongs to us, etc. So, anybody else? Yeah, that's what I'm saying too, is that uh, the whole Mississippi thing, I think you raised the sharp criticism back in 85 after, uh, after uh, uh, the so-called uh, black movement in Philadelphia at United with Wilson Good. Yeah. The rest of them were down south. Yeah. That Philadelphia was open because nobody was the police. Until after people supposed to point it went there. Yeah. The movement is they because of that. Yeah, he's talking about the new Africanist movement, you know, uh, how many of them were located in Philadelphia, but they were going to the national homeland down south. So they left Philadelphia and went down south. And then, of course, what happened was, but they had participated in helping to get Wilson Good elected as the mayor. And Wilson Good ends up dropping a bomb on the African community while they somewhere in North Carolina. But we were there. We told the masses, uh, rep, uh, you know, reinforcements on the way. And that's what took us into Philadelphia, in fact. Penny, you were about to say something. Oh, Lord, Chairman, I really appreciate this, this study. And um, I really, you know, unite with, of course, you were talking to, to the Solidarity Committee when, when you gave this presentation. And just the fact that the significance of APSC, the formation of APSC by the party, and you said the Achilles heel of U.S. imperialism has been Nick. And that this has never happened before in history, and it was an advancement, and still proves to be so today. And how the question of material solidarity and reparations—that it, you know, it, it's a bar. It created a, um, you know, um, a situation where a white person could not claim to be a revolutionary any longer um, without dealing with one absolute solidarity under the leadership of the African liberation and two, 
um, commitment to reparations, which is turning back over the stolen resources of parasitic capitalism that white people, all white people sit on the pedestal. And um, I just, you know, I just think that this is a thing and that you, you know, I just unite with it, obviously from being an APSC, but I, I think that it is one of the problems of the African revolution that the African People's Socialist Party has solved, as you say in the political report to the plenary Uhuru. Uhuru. Well, the other thing that it does is because white people are, have been a mystery. And I, I don't say this lightly. I say mystery because people have never been confronted with this kind of viciousness, violence, and terror that's been waged against the whole world. It's not even that that that, that white people stole uh, what we might call, what is now called America. I mean, when white people came here uh, in Massachusetts, or they could have settled uh, in Rhode Island, and that was been enough territory for the white people, I mean, to control the white people. They, that wasn't, they took everything, kill everybody, take everything, and have gone all over the world in that fashion. That's, that's, that's a mystery. I mean, what what kind of and so it's come up with all kinds of uh, 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 theories about white people that made white people genetic mutations and made white people the devil and stuff like that and uh, but we are revolutionary materialists and uh, we understand who white people are and, and we don't find it mysterious at all it pisses us off but we're not there's no mystery there we understand the material basis for why are, why white people act like they do and, and what they do. And uh, if you got a, a whole uh, a political economy that is organized around taking other people's stuff and holding other people's stuff, uh, and you have a, a superstructure that is born of that, that justifies, explains why it's good, that's what people call racism and stuff like that, and you create uh, institutions, uh, uh, armies, uh, courts, uh, political systems, etc., to uh, maintain that whole relationship and you have attitudes in the minds of the people who have come to power like that and because every time an African in the dark someplace because we're always in the dark ready to attack an old white woman snatch a person do some harmful to us that's the recapture of resources the taking back everything that's been taken from us that's normal that's a normal thing for any for human beings to strike out and to kill people and take stuff that's been taken from them that's the deprive them and their family of a way to live. That's normal. But in the life that we live, it's abnormal because white people, the ones who took every damn thing, the criminal now defining what is legal, Crime, defining what is thievery. Apparently they have a saying about, uh, uh, that uh, possession is 99% of ownership. Uh, don't say where you got it, how you got it, anything like that. I got it, uh, so 99% of ownership. And so this is a relationship that that owes itself uh white people function a certain way of having uh created having come to power having uh uh, uh created a, a social system that is parasitic that requires the brutal suffering and expropriation of value from everybody else for their own success for every wedding every church that's built every synagogue all of this stuff needs us to be oppressed etc in order to have it and they don't say let's have uh, a wedding for our daughter off the blood of black people they don't say that they don't say let's you do this and that off slavery and colonialism so they construct uh, philosophy and they construct social systems that justify that so we say there's nothing mysterious about this thing whether it ain't even about whether you like white people i mean or not it's about understanding what the reality is and then creating uh, uh, theories and practical means by which you overcome this, you overturn this. We're scientists. That's part of what science is. So that my thing that influences me is not how much I dislike white people or how much I dislike the police. And, and, and I have a visceral response to police, but so what? I understand who they are. I understand what their function is in society, understand how they came into being and what it would take to get them out of being and get them out of our lives and to change the world. That's the science of it. So I think that's one of the things important about APSC because it demystifies the question of white people. It said, look, white people do exist. You cannot say white people don't exist. 
because people are not running, shooting themselves in the back while running away, right? Uh, white people do exist, and slavery did exist, and all these other kinds of things. So taking into consideration that they exist, do we solve the problem recognizing that they're all mutations? Okay, white people, uh, genetic mutations. So what does that say about what we're supposed to do? Get an army of uh, geneticists? You know, uh, what, how do we get out of this if, if, if uh, uh, white people are the devil? So you get an army of priests, uh, uh, preachers, or something like that. Exorcist. You know, yeah, we have the exorcists. We, you know, uh, exorcists. What five? Uh, no, you say we are revolutionaries, and the same genetic mutations attack Vietnam. The same devils attack Vietnam. Genetic mutations uh, did the the Bay of Pigs in Cuba. The same devils did that. And the Cubans and the Vietnamese and every other revolutionary movement that has meant anything uh, have been able, uh, has been able uh, to be victorious, not through prayer and this other kind of stuff, but through creating some kind of revolutionary science that recognized the practical reality that they have with imperialism and white power. That's what we have to do, too. So I don't even get too bogged down in, in the white man, this and that. I talk like that sometimes because uh, sometimes I... I go where people are on some kind of subjective level, but the, and sometimes, because white people piss you off, you know, white people keep you pissed off, you know, because they have an imperial attitude, don't they? they like they're supposed to rule and dominate everything and nothing you say makes any sense and everything. Mm -hmm. You know, so I recognize that, but that's a, that's a subjective factor. Condition that gives rise to that subjective attitude is the thing that I want to get, in this, and get a grip on. That's what we have to understand anyway. Anything else? I want to give, uh, if it's possible, if your comrades got anything, want to do it because we're going to close it down in a minute. Uh -huh. Yes, Rafi. When you discussing earlier about um, Omar Johnson, who was a little, uh, a, a little, comp, little verbal confrontation between him and his other guy, that's pretty typical of the lack of uh, a different. <laughs> individuals it's like a fit concept and I find that pretty typical even out here in Brooklyn where you have all the organizations that we have even tried to uh, gain solidarity uh, you know establish solidarity with but it's like a fit concept it's like having five churches on the same block in Bethel Stuyvesant and none of them are doing anything it was you know conditions changing the conditions of the community you talk about between those two individuals it was subjective one of the problems that you mentioned was important was that they don't have no, no revolutionary designs. They're talking about uh, some F one of the guys that want some esoterical stuff and other guys that want some other stuff and so on and so forth, but they don't even really meet. It's sort of it's sort of a result in this it boils down to like a pit contest with, with, with individuals as opposed to having any kind of interest in, in solidarity and looking at it from the point of view of what we're gonna do for the people collectively as opposed to seeing things being uh, based around ourselves. Well, one of the things that hopefully this and other discussion we'll have and, and the political journals and everything that we produce, hopefully what it will do is make the masses of the people intolerant of that uh, kind of discussion. Whether they, anybody agrees with us or disagrees, but that we have to have a real low tolerance for uh, nonsense and people trashing our movement in that fashion. And that's what we saw. We, we saw the movement being trashed and we also saw uh, these forces, because they get away with being able to call themselves some kind of representative of some kind of black things, what they call a consciousness movement, I don't know what the hell that is. Uh, 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 they they uh, sully the movement, they lower the standards of the movement, and they set us up for uh, a physical uh, military assault by the government, by the American government. They create, put, if you have that kind of standard, believe me, there's an army of provocateurs, people who, uh, on the payroll of the United States government uh, that's laying there to do the same kinds of things they did to us in the 60s that led to a lot of people dying. And that's a, that's a problem. I'm going to ask, uh, Tim, we'll go ahead quickly. Facebook, funny name. Um, <laughs> Please, go ahead. How can, how, can have a, how can we have a revolution with the division of spirituality? I don't understand the question, so I can't. I can't I don't know. I don't. I don't understand the question at the moment because we're not spiritualists, so I don't understand the question. Uh, we are materialists, and I want to be clear on that too, because there are a lot of stuff that invades this space that 
uh, we're trying to define right now. That's why we even mentioned uh, Mr. Johnson, uh, is because we're trying to define the space and what, char what can be legitimately characterized as revolution and what cannot be legitimately characterized as revolution. So we're not spiritualists, we're materialists. And we understand that what confronts us on a daily basis is the material reality and not, not some spirits, not some spooks, and not uh, or whatever. I don't understand that question. And I appreciate the fact that it was raised, and I wish we had more time and so that the, the person who raised the question could elaborate more and we could appropriate response from me. I, the person deserves a better response from me, but I can't respond better because I don't, we haven't elaborated on the question sufficiently to inform me. Uh, so, uh, if there's one more, we'll take it, and then we got to go. Nobody else? Miss Mia. <laughs> okay. So, I want to, uh, I really want to uh, express appreciation for everybody uh, coming on. Uh, I think next Sunday, uh, we'll be involved uh, in the plenary, and I want to invite everybody uh, to participate in the uh, African People's Socialist Party. Uh, I think this is our third uh, plenary subsequent to our party that occurred in 2013. Uh, that's going to be uh, from the 7th through the 9th. And also, uh, I'm hoping that everybody who's participating in this discussion will also meet with us in Washington, D.C. on January 14th, uh, where with the Black is Back Coalition for Social Justice, Peace, and Reparations, we're going to hold a rally for self-determination. This too, in our estimation, is part of the means uh, by which we put revolution back on the agenda. It helps us to understand that the struggle we're involved in is against colonialism. You talk about self-determination, you're talking about taking control of our own destiny uh, uh, away from uh, foreign and hostile colonial power. We hope that you'll be there. Uh, it's also important for you to know uh, that this is the day before the anniversary of the, uh, uh, the birth of Martin Luther King. And uh, people have been hustling Martin Luther King since the very day that he was murdered, when Jesse Jackson took, uh, rushed off to, from, from Memphis to Chicago and did some kind of television thing uh, uh, where what he claimed, uh, everybody knows it was a lie, mm -hmm. now he claimed then to have been a, a shirt with the blood of Martin Luther King on it. What a ridiculous thing. And uh, uh, I mean, that's how it told it uh, then. Uh, we we uh, talking about a Democratic Party that's trying to rescue itself from shambles. And uh, it doesn't frighten us because we know that the Democratic Party has never been a revolutionary organization, never, 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 never has been a revolutionary organization. It has always worked uh, against uh, Africans and oppressed people around the world. Uh, the Democrats were in power when Lumumba was killed. Well, uh, 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 Eisenhower was going out of power and Kennedy uh, was coming into power and they signed on to killing Lumumba. The Democrats were in power when the Bay of Pigs happened. Uh, the Democrats were uh, in power of uh, Johnson to overthrow Nkrumah uh, in Ghana. So uh, this stuff about Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, nothing changed with the Democratic Party Well, since Obama got there. So now the Democratic Party is in shambles. It's trying to rescue itself. And Al Sharpton is a, one of the main spokespersons, mouthpieces uh, for, the, for the Negro wing of the Democratic Party. And uh, he is also having uh, something, uh, something called We Shall Not Be Moved uh, on January 14th in Washington, D.C. too. If you ain't coming for no other reason, you ought to come to be with us on January 14th because it's time for us to push charlatans like that out of our lives and out of the political space uh, that, uh, of our struggle. Now, that's going to be January 14th. Uh, it starts at noon, is that right? At, uh, at, at noon. Uh, it's going to be uh, at uh, Pershing Park, uh, which is uh, right adjacent to Freedom Plaza. Uh, that's going to be on, on Northwest uh, uh, 14th and Pennsylvania uh, Avenue. I look forward to seeing you. This is blackisbackcoalition.org. Uh, uh, go to the website. You can get more information on that. Going to be a lot of important forces. And we also, you can get the Black is Back Coalition app by doing what? Oh.
iTunes, iTunes, App Store, iTunes, App Store, Google Play Store, and the Google Play Store. Play, 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 Play Store. Store, Google Play Store, and yes. iTunes App Store, and this Black is Back Coalition. Uh, Black is Black. And, um, dot org. Dot org. But the, app is, the app is Black is Black Black Coalition. Is back. Okay, Black Black. so please find it and let me see. I look forward to seeing all of you, uh, as many of you as possible, uh, here in St. Petersburg, Florida, where it's going to be a little, little cool. I think the weather's going to be in the 70s uh, <laughs> uh, in January. That ain't too bad. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely going to be different from what the weather's going to be on January 14th in Washington, D.C. So go yeah, ahead, come on. Yeah, buses. So go to the website and you can see what kind of information there is regarding buses and the possibility of buses. Thank you so much. And next, uh, so we won't be here next Sunday, but the week after, we'll be doing it again. Uhuru.